Welcome this morning to the Far North Tactical Saturday Morning Wake Up Call. In the studio, as always, from Far North Tactical, there is Aaron Bennett over there on the other side of the microphone. Good morning, Aaron. And from Bighorn Enterprises, the one who is yawning over there. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Floyd. I'm just the monkey behind the machine. We are here today to talk about liberty. Take it away, gentlemen. We did bring another monkey. Oh, that's right. Over there, hiding in the corner, one of your uh, your brood there, we've got Israel. Assailant. Say again? I'm an assailant. You're an assailant? Really? Accomplice. Accomplice. That's right. <laughs> wow. Getting worried. I'm, I am. I'm, 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 ner- I'm nervous now. <laughs> you got something to start it off with? Yeah, Steve says that um, the show's about liberty, right? And that's what the blog spot says, too, that... We're not going to bother ourselves with the daily antics of the political right or left. And we come on here and we talk about what we perceive as liberty all the time. And I've started to realize what that really comes down to is we come on here and talk about governance and how that pertains to the individual. And everybody that calls in argues that there is no governance, but there's government. So it's basically the argument's been the same for week after week month after month, we're saying governance and everybody else is saying government, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't think that the two can coexist. You can't have government and governance. And well, you can have government doing the governance. Right, but they're, we're talking about self-governance. So it, it seems like anybody that's um, proposing that government is the the answer they're saying that governance that there is no governance you can't you can't have governance and government at the same time you can't have self-government and government is what i'm trying to say i really wanted to read what you posted on the blog there uh first samuel 8 10 through 18 so did i do it so um the the israelites <coughs> In the Old Testament, they they were in a self-governing society. They had a spiritual leader that arbitrated disputes between them, so on and so forth. But they didn't have a centralized government. They didn't have um, any any king, so to speak. And that bothered them. It seems like the reasons the reasons that they cried out that they wanted a king are the same reasons that people call here and say that we have to have government. And if you look at what God says about it, he's basically saying, no, you don't need government because you already have governance. And here's what uh, what it says in 1 Samuel 8, 8, 8, 10 through 18. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for, him, for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain in your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. In that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Thanks so much for making my head explode. That that sounds exactly like what we've got now. It's not a king, but I mean, look at the... That's what we have. The government is doing exactly those same things. That's what we have every single caller call in and say. The same mentality the Israelites have is even though we know that putting somebody in government above us, they're in the position to expropriate from us, and they do like crazy, and they essentially make slaves of us, and they take the best of everything that we have. They take 10% of what this government takes 40% of everything we have. But doesn't it... Their issue was they didn't want self-governance. They wanted power. They wanted government over them. 
And Josh and I come on here week after week and say, no, we should just have governance. We should rule ourselves. And pe people call in week after week and say, oh, you can't rule yourself. I think it's interesting. Uh, my favorite part of that whole those verses is the very end. He says, he'll take a tent of your flocks. And that day you will cry out. Oh, you will be a slave, and in that day you'll cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's fascinating. So because they in because they chose it for themselves. Right, they chose their their enslavement. So you know we have uh, just uh, hypothetical here. We have our uh, church services and stuff like that, and we say pray for the country, and we need to pray that God heals the land, and you know. Have we already made our choice? <laughs> uh, November. November, that's when we make our choice. It's the most influential, the most important election we've ever had. Well, I, so, I could say that the American Christians have cried out because of their king or whatever, because they've been enslaved. But because of the king that they've chosen for themselves, this democracy that we have chosen for ourselves, then that day the Lord will not answer you. Well, Hop brings up the the idea, I guess. Hans Hermann? Hans Hermann. He, po he poses it more down the lines of when um, when you go as a society to government rather than governance, uh, you're giving up ownership of your, of your physical body. And the reasoning behind that is if, if you're not allowed governance to yourself and the government claims ownership over you, and Josh has made some very good um, arguments of how government obviously claims ownership over you. They claim your life, if nothing else. They claim ownership of all of the goods that you make and goods that you have. Um, how is it that you can have two owners of your body? I mean, you can't be jointly owned, right? Can your physical body be joint? Can Josh own me and I own myself or in some kind of contractual agreement together that we both own my physical body <laughs> so the government claims ownership over your physical body much like the uh, slave owners claimed ownership of the physical bodies of the slaves there's no difference government claims ownership over your very being itself yeah but slaves aren't allowed to do anything they got to eat they're given a place to live. In some cases, the slaves are actually armed to help defend the uh, the compounds. So, good point. Very good point. If you, if you look into the history of slavery, you, you'll see a kind of a symbiotic relationship. There are an awful lot of slaves that had that accepted their lot and thought that they had it good because they had a good master. And that goes back not not just to the history of slavery in the United States. That goes back thousands of years. Look at the Romans. Look, yeah. at, the, look at the writings. There were slaves that knew how to read and write. There were slaves that taught the Roman citizens how to read and write. They were intelligent, sentient beings that embraced their slavery. And you got, somebody must have said something because all my lines are lit up. There. Well, I was just yeah. thinking about. I mean, I just want to go back real quick. With the uh, the Lord will not answer you in that day, because why does He say that? He's saying that because you have already made your choice. Don't whine to me about what you what about the choice you've made. Get out there and vote your life away. Give us a king and leave God alone. <laughs> you already made your choice. All right, so. You can't you can't assert that you have self governance or that there is any when government rules every aspect of your life and um, it's like Steve was just saying we consider ourselves to be the freest people on the earth because we we don't feel as oppressed as the other slaves around us but if you have no governance over any physical any part of your physical body as far as I can't go enter any in, enter into any kind of contractual anything with anybody without the state being arbitrator in that. I can't uh, make any decision outside of... I can't make any decision that anybody could... I don't think anybody could call up and talk about any decision that you could make that there isn't some kind of regulatory law governing that. And if there is no self-governance and government claims ownership over everything that you do, 
then don't they essentially own you? <laughs> because the, the when you define property, it's the original appropriation. And the government claims the original appropriation with your birth certificate the second you come out of the womb. They won't even consider you legitimate without your birth certificate and your social security number. I mean, am I... Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, for those folks that don't like to believe in the Bible, whatever, we'll go hit you on the other side. I want to read something from Lou Rockwell, who happens to be a Christian. Oh, my gosh. Libertarian, too. The critical problem we face today is the same one that all mankind has faced. The state. The monopolist who claim the right to break the laws that they make and enforce. How to restrain them is the critical problem of all sound political thinking. Making matters worse, this gang now has a monopoly on the money and the, bil- and the ability to print it. They are abusing that power at our expense. How does voting change the situation? Neither of the candidates for presidents wants to do anything about the problem. On the contrary, they want to make it worse. This is for a reason. The state owns the democratic process as surely as it owns the Department of Labor and Defense and uses it in a way that benefits the state and no one else. On the other hand, we do have the freedom to not vote. No one has yet drafted us into the voting booth. I suggest that we exercise this right not to participate. It's one of the few rights we have left. Non-participation sends a message that we no longer believe in the racket they have cooked up for us and we want no part of it. You might say that this is ineffective, but what effect does voting have? It gives them what they need the most, a mandate. Non-participation helps deny that to them. It makes them, just on the margin, a bit more fearful that they are ruling us without our consent. This is all to the good. The government should fear the people. Not voting is a good beginning toward instilling that fear. This year especially, there is no lesser of two evils. There is socialism or fascism. The true American spirit should guide every voter to have no part of either. What, what, when was is that brand new? Did he just write that? August fifteenth. Nice. So, can can you appeal to any higher law than the state? No. The state doesn't allow any law, any anything higher than itself. It is it's the arbitrator, and all of its its disputes. Even its own disputes. Right, even it's, it's the its final own judge dispute. and its own disputes. You have to go to a – if you're going to have a dispute with the state or the state has a dispute with you, the only place you can go to find relief is from that state, and they decide on whether they're right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just trying to point out how stupid it is. Right, Hans Hopp, I obviously kind of like that guy. You read too much, right? He, po- <laughs> he points out that um, – the state, in the fact that it is set up as, it sets itself up as the end-all arbitrator, it will tend to for, um, create squalor rather than settle squalor, because it, the more squalor that it has, the more it can twist any situation to its own advantage. Cash money. Because it's, it is the ultimate arbitrator in all disputes, so it doesn't matter how convoluted or jumbled, rather... It's more beneficial to have things convoluted and jumbled. So the system that we uh, have set up here by our founders, which admire them, obviously, but what it became today, I wish they could have had a little bit more foresight. Um, they, they did have foresight. I mean, they, 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 they wrote right into it this whole idea that you have to basically go out there and remake it. I mean, you look at Thomas Jefferson. He didn't see this thing lasting past 75 years. Right. Well, you got to follow up with what they started with was... Uh... But I, the, the biggest thing that gets me about the founders is that they were so grounded in common law and in the idea of self-governance. And every um, every value that they pull from comes from the common law. Yet in um, contract and in um, tort law... Everything that they point to is do all that you've agreed to do and don't transgress on anyone but uh, on any other person. And outside of that, they were pretty free. But they set up a system, which I don't understand. They they valued common law so much and considered it so sacred, but yet they set up a system of men that were able to legislate law. It's the first time ever that I can, other than um, Carthage, where men were allowed to legislate what was law. 
I guess the Romans did too. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Epic fails all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> so once you're able to um, legislate things into law, how can how can there be any standard to law? I mean, but I, mean, I don't even have to explain that one to anybody. All you got to do is look at our laws. It's outrageous. It's chaos. Everyone in the world, everyone in America admits that it's chaos. But you have to obey the law. You need to vote for more people to make more laws. And if you don't like the law, then what you have to do is, well, you don't know. Don't break it. Go ahead and obey it. But the next time around, you need to vote somebody in who will go back in and change the law. How many laws have been changed by legislators that we have voted in to go in and change the law? <laughs> How often does that now, happen? Seriously. No, they don't <laughs> change them. They'll, they'll, pass, they'll pass their own, which is awesome. Well, just, that, that, that just leads to more restrictions. When's the last time a law got repealed? Just stricken off the books. Doesn't happen. I can't. I can't think of one. I mean, there was prohibition, right? <laughs> yeah, we can go back uh, 80 years, 90 years, I guess. So we don't. Huh. We don't. Um, I don't even know. You can make my head explode. I'm my own head just explode. You're dumbfounded <laughs> by your own theory. I'm dumbfounded, dumbfounded by the fact that government is the arbitrator in all of its own disputes. It unilaterally, unilaterally has the power to tax and to legislate what is law, which that's the biggest mind boggler to me. And to decide what services you get for that tax and how much you should pay for it. And we want more. And we're going to vote for more November 6th. I'm not. <laughs> but lots of people are going to vote for more. I guess. Yeah. Let's see who wants to yell at Steve. All right. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake up call. Who's this? This is John Galt. John Galt. Who is John Galt? Right. So I was reading Lou Rockwell the other day, and it had an essay by Tolstoy about whether it was best to work in the system or out of the system. This is about 1880 in Russia. And uh, he concluded it was better to work out of the system. In other words, not in the political system. So then I, I read Drudge the same day, and there's three young ladies in Russia that are doing exactly that. And they're called Pussy Riot. And they're in jail for two years for hooliganism because they insulted Putin in a church. Wow. You guys know about that? Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Uh, I've heard something about it, too. They're, Everybody they're, in America are pussies, I, but we need a pussy <laughs> riot. That's what we need. Yeah. No, actually, I, I I looked up and listened to some of their music, and I, I got to tell you, it's not very good. No. I, I mean, the musical quality is just like, I mean, it's like a garage band. Exactly. But the, what I admire about them is that they're like, you know what? Look, I know I'm going to get arrested for this. I know you're going to throw me in jail for this, but I don't care. Yeah. Because well, the you, article, you're a tyrant. They were, they were giggling when they got their uh, yeah. two-year sentence. So uh, <laughs> is Josh still going to Tampa? No. Always oh, not. I hope there's a pussy riot in Tampa. It'll be interesting. I mean, they're uh, ready for war down there, though. I wouldn't suggest... Well, I don't know. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do, but they... Uh, I don't know if you've seen any articles about the gunboats they have running around in the rivers and the helicopters and hit squads, and they are ready for war at that thing. Yeah. The state, I mean. Right. Very interesting. You know, what's interesting about that is... Uh, they're scared that, I don't know, somebody's going to do something to disrupt the Republican convention, which makes the people that are going to go there scared and maybe do something less desirable because they're going, which makes the government more scared because the people are scared and they take measures to <laughs> protect themselves. So they have to protect themselves more, which makes the government more scared. It's like this culture of uh, fear. Yeah. Constant that, fear. That, no, that never happens in the, the political process. Come on. That, well, they're supposed <laughs> to be afraid of us, but unfortunately. We need, to, we need to find an entrepreneur that comes up with some T-shirts that says, Free Pussy Riot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate the phone call. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning. And this is the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? Hey, it's Bill. Bill, go ahead. The problem is we can't govern ourselves because we're too eager to kill each other. You know, they're just too eager. Uh, you know, you step on my toes and you're dead. You know, we can't govern ourselves. We're too eager to kill ourselves. If we were more apt to 
uh, befriend ourselves rather than, uh, you know, uh, pick up a gun and shoot me because I step on your property or maybe I'm coming over to give you a pie for, uh, for a welcome gift and you turn around and, you know, tell me get off your property or else I'll kill you. You know, that, that's self-governed. I guess that is self-governed, huh? Well, I don't see too many people blowing each other away here. You don't. You don't see how many. You don't hear about the people. Or just there's two bodies been found with a riddled car with kids in the back. There's two cops already been shot at and killed. And what? In, and, and they have Aren't they attributing those, those to yet. drugs? In Alaska? Or are you talking about the United States? Well, I don't know. It was on the news. Uh, I don't remember if it was in Alaska or the United States. But anyway. Well, we're talking about we close have, to 400 have, million we, people. We have racism here. I mean, we didn't have racism here until Obama showed up. Now we're, we're flooded with racism again. I thought we, uh, we, we solved that problem. And it turns out that it was always just hidden in the closet, just like uh, homosexuals. Now racism is, is like a boil on everybody's butt. Uh, racism yeah. was never, I mean, racism was always hidden in the closet. The closet was the government. The government uses racism. The government is racist. I mean, the government's the one that held had the Dred Scott. The government's the ones that uh, held the... Segregation. Segregation and African Americans down in the South. It wasn't the. I mean, there were. I'm not saying there weren't people, but it was the government. It was the. It was the that law that, that, that made segregation down there in the South. It wasn't the individual business owners. The individual business owners, in order to stay open, had to obey the law. Yeah, I think Bill, what you're talking about is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. What you're talking about is statism. Statism is what gets people nuts and kills people. The state's what. The state does kill people. I mean, you talk about uh, cops getting shot, and what about cops that shoot people? Or what? I mean, yeah, we have gone nuts, and there's a lot of murder, which is not good. But I would have to say that it's not because we're not able to self-govern; it's because we don't have to self-govern. Nobody we can, have a government doing it for us. Nobody can call on here and point to um, murders upon murders upon murders by people that are refusing to self-govern, but. If you, anybody would like, I could go off about democide. I could go off about genocide. We could be on here for a whole two-hour show just quoting figures of mass murder by government. By government. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, see. I'm willing to take the chance that we can self-govern ourselves. I, I like that idea myself. I mean, the Indians done it for, uh, I don't know how many years, because... You know, ever since they 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 did it by uh, the elders. The elders are the ones that made the decisions. You know, I mean, it, but it was a group of individuals that came up with the with the best solution for their whatever problem that they had, and that's what it was supposed to be. But now we have uh, corruption to the point where. You can't even get a group of individuals to uh, decide one way or the other without uh, corruption. Yeah, because you're talking about the state. The state is the corruption. Exactly. All right. Well, hey, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Appreciate it. We got less than a minute before the Fox News, the bottom of the hour. We can squeeze in that. No, go ahead. Did you take a call? Well, we we can, or we can put or keep them on hold. I was going to say that. I've been doing a lot of reading on the mass killings in Russia, and they actually put the number at 43 million because in the count where everybody quotes 20 million, they didn't include any of the uh, camp deaths from 1936 and after 1950. They didn't include any of the executions from 1939 to 1953. They didn't include any of the deportations of people that died in camps from 1939 to 1953. Yeah, well, those guys were so in, in the Haldemar, they didn't count the 5 million that died in that. All right, welcome back to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here. It's from uh, Far North Tactical. It's, uh, the, the whole point of this program, of course, is that uh, these Bennett brothers, they approached me. They said, hey, Steve, we want to get this thing on the air. 
And, uh, well, you know what? Money talks. Why? The, the whole the whole point of it here is that this is a sponsored show in the sense that it, it is produced by the Far North Tactical and then uh, the second hour there by Bighorn Enterprises. And you guys get a chance, an opportunity here, a bully prophet, to talk about what you want to talk about. And you set the agenda. I did. I tried to um, show that what we come on here and talk about week after week is just the idea of self-governance. And it seemed, from my perspective, and I, I never did listen to any of the shows. You know, we just come on here, have them, and go home. But in the last uh, week or so, I've been riding around in, in a semi working for Josh, and I've been listening to a lot of the shows that we've had. And just just trying to get some self improvement, you know. But the biggest contrast that I've noticed is that day after day we're basically arguing the same thing: self governance. And everybody calls in, and they're arguing for government. They're arguing for somebody over them. What is it about self governance that we fear so much? So basically, what we by advocating for government, you're saying that you don't believe in liberty. Because there is no liberty if there is no self-governance. Because you can't you can't be jointly owned. How how is there any liberty? I mean, well, t- take it out of the the jointly owned of a person and think about if you owned a car. Use something that everybody can relate to and say because I don't think most people have ever really thought about owning their own bodies because they, they're so accustomed to not. They're, they're being accustomed to being told what to do. But I mean, you think about owning a car. If if I went in and I said, hey, Aaron and Josh, let's all three of us buy a car. It's our car. We own it jointly. And I and and you want to go take the car out, but I've already got it. Sorry, I'm, I'm Steve's already got it. It's out today. And then the next time I bring it home, all of a sudden Josh takes it out. And well, gee, Aaron doesn't get a chance to use the car. Let's take it a step further. And do all three of us own that car outside well, of registering it, insuring it, having the license to drive it? Yeah, the difference is that all three of us would agree to pay money for that car and have equal ownership. The state doesn't pay. It just claims ownership. It just says, you're mine. All right, the state the state does claim ownership over it. They, they claim ownership over your right to drive. You don't have a right to drive. They claim ownership over your ability to drive it by making you get a license to drive. They claim ownership over the vehicle itself by making you register that vehicle with the state. And they claim ownership over accidents that haven't even happened yet by forcing you to get insurance. <laughs> they claim ownership over the whole nine yards, and then they claim ownership over the road and how you're going to drive on it. They regulate every aspect of that vehicle and you from the time you drive out of your driveway. I mean, Steve's got a great point. You just didn't throw in the state part. But the way that Josh said it, if we did all three buy a vehicle... That would be entering into a contractual agreement ourselves. And if I'm supposed to have it on Wednesdays and don't have it on Wednesdays because Steve decided he was going to go joyriding, then that's a breach of the contract. Exactly. There is no breach of the contract on the state side who's the arbitrator in their own disputes. It'd be as if going back to the three of us owning the car, if, if you came to me and said, hey, Steve, you broke your contract. And I said, what contract? We don't need a, we don't need a contract. Yeah. Oh, it... it it would be it would be if Joshua was the ultimate decider of that contract, <laughs> and he would definitely rule in his favor that uh, the contract really reads that he's allowed to use it whenever he wants, and we can both just get bent. <laughs> and the best part would be, you know, he might actually allow us to use it sometimes, give us the privilege of using it. As long it. as we have the right permit. As long as you pay me. Right, then we would be the... Uh, <laughs> and, God, and, God, and God forbid, God forbid that you should do something to to make Josh angry, because then he might revoke your permission to use it forever. And so I'm sorry, you no longer have the right to use that. Yeah. You have been barred for life. Because it's not, it wouldn't be our property if Josh was the ultimate arbitrator in that. Exactly. Uh, I think I think we've made the point we could keep beating the oars, but I think it's not breaking anymore. <laughs> Should we go back to the phones or do something else? Let's go to the phones and hear people advocate for the state. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. Welcome to this Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? This is Billy, man. Hey, Billy, go ahead. I'm sort of not going to advocate for the state. 
But I do want to remind folks out there that may get a little frustrated here in the problem without the answers that there is an answer. There is an answer. All you have to do is recognize the state and give it a name, and the name is Babylon, and then the Bible tells you what to do. You have to remove your body from the jurisdiction of Babylon. And it may not be possible in this modern world to do so completely, but you have to do it as best as you can. And then you have less and less government interference in your life and more and more self-governance. And I know Aaron and Josh, maybe they're absolutists or something, and they're not willing to go part way or they're not willing to respect those that try to go part way. But that's the answer, is to get out of Babylon. You know, we're all for people doing anything, no matter how small, to remove themselves from it. Well, I no assure you, I have small. a large amount, not just a small amount, I have a large amount of self-governance. Because the fact of the matter is, if you merely refuse to take a license, if you refuse to take a permit, if you refuse to pay your taxes, if you remove your physical property from the immediate environs of the government, uh, in my particular case, I think I also have a lot of grace given to me by the Lord to make me invisible to the government, but that's accessible too. If you do that, you can live by and large without much government interference. I know, because I do. All right, but if a guy owns a vehicle and he decides that he is going to not get a driver's license because he doesn't believe that the state should be um, a third party in that, mm -hmm. what happens when he gets pulled over? Uh, I've been to court twice in this state for that very charge, and both times they've let me go. Hmm. I've talked to them. I've prayed ahead of time, and I've told them what the Holy Spirit told me to say. I didn't worry about what I was going to say until I went into the courtroom. I told them the truth, and both times so far, they've let me go. At the present time, I see police officers that know me. I see the police officer that arrested me, and he nods, and I drive by. <laughs> That's good. If more people would do it, it would be easier for me. Hey, I'm out there doing it for you. I am asking more people to join me in divorcing Babylon, one piece at a time, because the more of us do it, and again, remember, if they arrest you, go to court, refuse a lawyer, don't pay a lawyer anything, represent yourself and demand a jury, and then they'll let you go. Not necessarily. I'm not promising to let you go. So far, they've let me go. So far, they've let me go. Like I said, I believe I have a lot of grace given to me by the Lord as well. He puts grace on me, and then for some reason or another, they don't persecute me as bad as they used to. So they're letting me go. I'll say it that way. So far. But if you don't, if you're not willing to do that much, okay, then do whatever you can. But I'm just giving you a report, a good report that I'm being successful so far in living without very much government interference. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I'd like to hit really quick on the, the Babylon ideology. I get a lot of people that um, write me emails and stuff and talk about, um, and this is only coming from Christians, who write me and talk, talk to me about, well... None of this really matters. The battle isn't of this world, this and that. And they all view the time we're going through right now uh, as the end times. And um, they point to attrition in America, if it comes down to that, that that's just the sign of the end times. It's something that should be celebrated. But you look back in history, and every single society that gets oppressed thinks it's the end times. Just because America uh, may have an economic collapse and have the worst time of it in history. I mean, I think if America, in my personal opinion, if America has an economic collapse, we're going to tear each other apart. Absolutely rip each other limb from limb. Absolutely. They're going to eat the, the flesh of their own arm, let alone eat everybody else. The, obviously, if the Bible says that they're going to eat the flesh of their own arm, that's the prophecy. That that's how bad it'll get. Well, obviously, they'll eat each other first. So, well, yeah, I, they'll be cannibalism. And, they'll and, be cannibalism. I, and I personally don't believe that America having... Um, hard times is, is necessarily the end times. Governments, peoples, 
societies all through history have had horrible and unspeakable times. And you look at uh, I'm not, I'm in, not the 19- better, in the 1970s, in the 1970s, the British people were literally eating each other. That's in the 70s. And America came and saved them, like but they had two years of literal cannibalism going on in England that nobody ever likes to talk about because it was all Keynesian economics, and we embrace it so hard, nobody wants to talk about what happened in England when they, when the um, pound fell because they were financing, the, the world was trading the, was the sterling, right? The world was trading the sterling as the international money. And they had a collapse, the same one, identical to what's happening here. People stopped trading in their money, and they had this huge collapse. And people literally ate each other for about two years before America stepped in and saved them. And that's when we officially became the world money that got traded. Well, people, just to clarify, I'm not saying Jesus is coming back anytime soon. I'm not, I'm not preaching that at all. I'm merely saying that, yeah, the world's going to go through a lot of trouble. And people that don't prepare for it are going to be in a terrible situation. Right. But the point I'm trying to make is um, I'm not saying that you're saying that necessarily. What I'm saying is so many Christians out there become complacent mm-hmm. with the situation they're in because it's the end times. Right. And because they believe they're going to be raptured out of it. That's, that's the real issue. Exactly. Doctrine. That's Error. the real issue right there. We don't need that's to do a, nothing. Yeah, that's the doctrinal issue that tears them up, yeah. They, they're complacent because they think they're going to get toaster pastry pop out of here. <laughs> well, they're not totally complacent. They're going to vote for Romney. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's going to solve all the problems. Revolution 2012, right? Uh, Whatever. I, the the <laughs> ultimate answer is you have to get physically out of Babylon. You have to give back to that which is which means money. You have to stop the Federal Reserve note. You have to live elsewhere. They can't. So you have to make it inconvenient for them to come get you. And then the whole system, when it collapses, well, it's going to be the freedom of those of, of us who are living outside of the system will be back. When Babylon is cast into the ocean and all the lights go out again, well, I'll be glad. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, all right. Timothy. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is the number if you'd like to participate in the conversation by phone. And uh, if not, of course, you can just uh, listen to Aaron and Josh stir things up here. It's kind of like a great big giant hornet's nest, and we all have sticks, and we're just kind of poking at it to see what flies out of the other end. I, can I ask you guys a question? How come Frank hasn't called? That's a good, that's a good question. He hasn't called for a couple of weeks. Frank, you out there? Calling Frank Turney. All right. Be, before before we get Frank Turney on the line, which I'm I've sure heard of called Duke's show recently, though. And he called he's called my show the last. Uh, oh, that and yeah, it wasn't Duke's show. It was your show when you had. Uh, candidates on yeah that gal that you had on that he drilled on the ndaa she wow she skirted that so hard she would not say that she would stand up for the people stand up for the constitution i can't believe i couldn't believe that i can't believe anybody votes for that lady well the, the whole issue of the ndaa the national defense authorization act that indefinite detention that's kind of woven into it that, that i mean it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning of the show our legislators have the power to create law out of thin air. Who are we to say that any one particular law is unjust? That's true. I mean, at, at the point when they go in there, once they have created it and it becomes law, well, then we have a duty to bow down and obey it. Same thing with Obamacare. Exactly. Exactly. You know, these people that, that whine and complain about the laws that have been passed, it's, it, do you not understand this? You, we are reaping what we've sowed. It, it's not just a matter of we need to get somebody else in there to vote in a new set of laws. It, we, have, we have tipped so far on, on the opposite side of where we should be in terms of freedom. I, I don't think it can be fixed incrementally. Josh and I were talking about this actually before we started this morning. And so many people say, well, we've gotten to this point incrementally. We need to go back incrementally. Have you ever tried to incrementally unpluck a chicken? <laughs> uh, I mean, have you? Once it's on, well, I mean, well, once I, it's plucked, it's pretty much plucked, isn't it? We, I think that the Bible verse um, Samuel that we read this morning it sums the whole thing up. I mean, you ask for it. Mm-hmm. This is what's going to happen to you. And the Israelites still screamed for it. He said, "Here, here's what you're asking for." They're going to take, 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 and take from you. You're no longer going to be 
rulers of yourselves. You're going to be slaves. It flat out says you're going to be slaves. What is the opposite of self-governance? What is the opposite of governance? It's slavery. Government is slavery. Spelled out, and for all the Christians that listen, it's spelled out. We just spelled it out from the Bible. Government is slavery. Oh, no, they're only talking about a king. Now, our government's even worse because a king was only able to interpret that which was already law. We're allowed to create law. And how convoluted, can do it. Yeah. how evil is that to create law? Because you can create law such as abortion, pro choice. That was a created law. Making what is, by all, all, all accounts, murder. It's the end of a human life. No, not by all accounts. That's how we ended up with pro-choice. Well, it's also, I mean, if you think about it, though, if you can systematically decide this entire set of people are not people and can be killed, I mean, that, that's, that's how we've gotten every single bit of genocide. Right, so why don't we do that with gingers? They don't have souls. The Christians will be okay with that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just I'm making a South Park joke. Wow. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> but if you're going to advocate for government, then you're advocating for slavery. How can it be construed as anything else? You're advocating for slavery and murder and theft, right? Because taxation is theft. Right. War, then, war is murder. And since government is all those things, but they're the arbitrator in all those things and the end decision maker in their own judgment. So there's no justice in the system at all. And the argument for a little bit of it is the same argument for the world government. Mm -hmm. Right. How can anybody be a proponent for government, this government that we have, and not be a proponent for the one world government? How is it any In fact, it's even better. Because if you're a proponent of government, then why not have a world government? It makes sense. Well, Murkowski just said this week that she hopes that the Senate passes the Law of the Sea Treaty during the uh, this upcoming break in between. And basically, she's talking about the time in between the election after after November when they're not accountable for their actions. That, that you know, basically, everybody who's still in office at that point, either they're safe and they've been reelected or they're out and they have nothing to lose. And so she's like, she really hopes that we pass the Law of the Sea Treaty, which, have you followed the Law of the Sea Treaty at all? No, thanks. All right, Josh, are you familiar with it? Basically, if we become a signatory to the Law of the Sea Treaty, we give up any right to the waters that are right off our shore. That we no, we would no longer have any rights out there in, in the high seas. We are completely, the United States of America, we'd be completely subject to the will of the United Nations. And if you go read um, anything about the laws on the high seas, the open seas, anything two miles off everybody's shore, those laws are all I think still... It's seven. Is it seven? I think seven you can like start dumping trash and oil and... Build your own kingdom. Build your own kingdom. <laughs> in the water. <laughs> the, back in the time when um, Britain and France were huge empires... And the waterways were obviously the main mode of transportation. They came up with a bunch of laws that governed the seas. And those are still the same ones that are in effect today. They haven't changed them. But all of those laws deal with sovereignty on the high seas. Everybody that was on the sea was sovereign. And that's, I would assume, without reading it, that that's what they're trying to strip away. That it's exactly what gets stripped away with the law of the sea treaty, that there is no sovereignty. Everyone answers to the United Nations on the high seas if, right, so if, if we sign on to this, and then it becomes ratified. And it... if, let me give you an example. If if we wanted to move to um, um, Mexico, no, no, Mexico is not a good one. Let's say we wanted to move to Australia because we wanted to get out of America. If we were going to fly ourselves there and fly our families there, the rigmarole to actually get there would be brutal. It would be a lot harder than people think to remove yourself from America, move your stuff, move your family, everything else, going through the government process of trying to fly there. But if you were to go get a, your own boat and dock it up, load it up with everything you have, and load up your family and 
just sail to Australia. There, this minute that you got off of our shore, you're sovereign. You can go all the way there unimpeded and arrive there unimpeded. Our ports are the freest, freest places of travel in the world. Even American ports, even with the TSA, they're, they're still the freest bastions on the planet. Um, not for long. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're working on that. <laughs> as far as the way that our, the seas and the ports are all governed, it doesn't get any freer than that. Merchants are the freest people in the world just because of the laws haven't changed. No, it's about to change, though. Well, of course. No. That doesn't you surprise gotta, me gotta at all. tighten up that little loophole. All right. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? It's Cecily. Good morning, Cecily. <laughs> I guess you don't recognize my voice this early. <laughs> um, the the ticket is when you pass a bunch of laws and treat everybody like criminals, they will respond and be criminals. It's like um, approach determines result kind of thing. And then so when you send your, you know, kids to school to be indoctrinated uh, into the slavery. I mean, they're, you can tell just right away they are taught to obey. And um, and then when you have your own children and you teach them only to obey rather than to think about what they're, what they're doing and what their consequences of what they're doing. Anyway, just cognitive. Of course, then there's a lot of crazies out there, you know, and people who have um, mental disorders, schizophrenia, and, and Alzheimer's, and and all that stuff, and uh, so people that wear badges and robes, just uh, so jockeys. You know, yeah, exactly. So then, when when you when you think about all those things, it's uh, how do you manage that? You know, and and, and uh, you know, just uh, as far as you know, law the laws that people are making it. So, most, a lot of them are just so that they look good and make more money, as they say. It, um, oh, there was a great poem on on the television. The guy said in there that I remember that um, that these legal pads um, um, were um, upturned, bleeding hands. That that kind of put how laws are about you know. Open, upturned, bleeding hand. So anyway, Thanks. let's uh, let's all subscribe to that uh, magazine and and live in misery or fill our minds with the uh, with the um, plants and animals and <laughs> the nature of and the beauty of of a, a no. grand view. See, Cecily, you can't you can't fill your mind with certain plants because that would be against the law. <laughs> it depends on. Oh, yeah, well, you <laughs> and know, you dare what, not put them in your body. Yeah, you know, that's very moral to 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 make a plant, which is you know a uh, god uh, produced illegal to <laughs> some people, and then other people can lord it over you whether you can have it or not. It's just all these people setting themselves up to be power tripping over somebody else's mind and soul and body it just gets weird when you you know when when you want to take responsibilities for somebody's mind and soul and body except that you don't want to pay for it i was just sitting there thinking it just occurred to me that god is the ultimate lawbreaker how is oh because he he gives plants to people without the government's well permission? it doesn't give them to them but how does this how does things grow Oh, that's right. Well, does God make does God make all the plants and the, I think all we the beasts arrest and him. all this and that? Yeah, arrest he's him. definitely got a warrant out for his arrest. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he hasn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Cecily, thanks for the call. Appreciate that. Four five eight talk is the number. Uh, good morning. This is the wake up call. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? This is Trevor. How you guys doing today? Trevor, good, good morning. I was reminded of a, I think it's a John Adams quote that I normally hear on your other show, and it says something to the effect that our Constitution is intended for the governments of a moral people. Mm. It is inadequate for any other. I'm yeah. Paraphrasing, I don't remember it yeah, completely, it's but pretty close to it. Yeah. A moral and just people. And throw into that one uh, the Bible that a little yeast leavens the whole lump. 
you know, you give like the camel's nose under the tent is the one that I keep hearing lately in the news. But uh, you give a little bit to something that you think is going to be completely harmless, say, for government to, well, we Exist. want people to drive safe cars. Right. So as a result, you need a vehicle safety inspection before they'll give you a license plate that says it's okay to drive it. And everybody goes, well, great. Well, then to regulate giving you that little license plate, they have to have uh, prison industry to print the license plates. And they have to have the DMV to keep track of who has them. And boom, you have a whole new branch of government. Right, all all the laws are for our own good. We understand that. Uh, George Washington <laughs> right. George Washington lamented before his death his decision his decision to put down the whiskey rebellions. And you're talking right out the gate in America. He he murdered essentially he murdered American citizens by calling out the military to keep them suppressed because there wasn't any currency back then, and whiskey was traded instead of dollars. Is the only way of preserving their corn harvest, if I remember right. Some good times right there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just, I'd like to be fed in whiskey. <laughs> I don't know the money anymore that the um, Federal Reserve note. I want the private reserve. <laughs> well, if that was what was in Fort Knox, more people would want to visit. <laughs> hey, it wouldn't be safe, man. <laughs> Thanks for the call. We're coming up on the Fox News here at the top of the hour. On the other side, we'll start our second show, Patriots Lament, right here on KFAR. Check us out online, patriotslament.blogspot.com. Must steal wealth from one part of society to give to another part of society. Here's our conservative champion, right? It has to be preserved for future generations, and we've got to change things so my children can steal from other people, too. And it's kind of going to be funny when that boy gets the old wake-up call, you're bankrupt, you ain't going to have it. You're already 99, between 73 and $200 trillion in debt for services that you have to give people guess what you are not going to preserve that it's going to come about with all these promises you guys have been giving everyone that i will take care of you through medicare medicaid social security blah 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 blah, blah. it's done there's no saving it it is bankrupt well, i've been calling it the paul ryan scam because all paul ryan is is to get the libertarian vote it's to get the ron paul crowd on board with mitt romney Paul Ryan comes on the radio shows. I've been catching him and listening to him. I mean, the first words out of his mouth are is that he's an he believes in Austrian economics. And you look at all of his proposed policies, and they're all 100% Keynesian. Yeah, he's a fascist. So he, he's just a parrot. He's parroting um, Austrian economics. He comes on the shows and says the correct things. He's trying to pull that. I mean, you have Glenn Beck saying, oh, do you think this is going to pull in all the Ron Paul supporters? Sure, that's what the whole scam's about. But you can't sit there and say that you're for Austrian economics and so on and so forth, and all your policies are Keynesian. Yeah, we went over it last week. That, uh, his his budget still increases the debt increases the debt by seven trillion dollars, and he wants his budget um, actually balances the budget in 30 years. 30 years. What a joke. In other words, let's make it so far out there that we aren't going to be... I mean, he's not going to be around in 30 years, we hope. And they want to push these things off to where they're not actually responsible to balance it now. With Ron Paul, at least he said, I'll cut a trillion bucks in one year. I'll balance the budget. Boom. Gone. Because he'll just fire people. 440,000 people he was going to fire the first day he got into office. That was so sweet. And Mitt Romney's not going to be able to fix it. Paul Ryan is not going to fix it. And the next go around, your Tea Party people are not going to fix it. They're bankrupt. They're so bankrupt. I mean, that guy called, you know, he said, can you put this in perspective instead of talking trillions Mm -hmm. and zillions? The problem is that we can do that, but the fact of the matter is it is incomprehensible. 
because it is trillions and trillions and trillions and hundreds, hundred trillion dollar debt in benefits and pers and ters, whatever they call them and all that. We are screwed. You look over at the borough, they're going to get, um, I'm pretty sure that the uh, union people over there, they're going to get their raise this year, right? They get a raise every year, a COLA raise or whatever, cost of living allowance. They're going to get more benefits or at least a little bit added to their benefits. And we're going to hire more people or at least, well, we never fire anyone. And even if we do, they still get their benefits. It's it's not sustainable. Country going down. You're broke. And going out to vote to be more broke isn't going to help you. Well, and now Paul, Ron- and Paul Ryan is also talking about saving Medicare. Yeah, that's what he was uh, at the top of the hour. You're saving so an entitlement program. And he doesn't. they don't want to repeal Obamacare like everybody thinks. They want to replace it with a Republican version of Obamacare. So it would be a Romney care. So can the, you tell me what the difference is between the Republicans and the Democrats? Absolutely nothing. But if for, you know, a lot of people try and argue with me that we should vote in Mitt Romney just based on the fact that he will get rid of Obamacare. But they're not proposing to get rid of it. They're propose, proposing to replace it. They come right out and say it. They're going to replace it, not get rid of it. With their own plan. Right. Yeah, probably because they didn't have anything in there for uh, conscription. <laughs> we'll probably throw that in there, Republicans, because they got some wars to get on. Oh, well, yeah, the time the clock's ticking. I mean, we got we got to be at war with Iran in the next uh, year, or or else uh, it's all going to fall apart, right? <laughs> yeah, we got to have we got to do it sooner or later. We got to do it sooner than later, otherwise we're going to miss our opportunity to have a war. Well, besides the fact that all the and uh, only folks in the army are committing suicide at record numbers right now, we got to replace the numbers in the army. Yeah, that's gotta, pretty sad. Got to get them from somewhere. Why is that? Why, why is it sad? No. Why are they committing suicide? Oh. Think it has anything to do with the cognitive dissidents that they're being sent off to fight for something that does not make sense? Yeah. I'm not a psychologist, but I can see where that's pretty much got to be it. Uh, if Mitt Romney does win, just purely looking at it from a Keynesian point of view, if Mitt Romney does win, it will be good for the economy. I, my personal hope is that Mitt Romney wins, which is, I feel ridiculous for even saying that. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at, what? what? But the, the only reason is, I mean, it's a very shallow reason, and that reason is because investors will um, continue, they'll start to spend money again and go out and make malinvestment. Right now you have... Uh, Americans are taking all their wealth and paying off all their debt. The average, when Obama came into office, the average um, credit card debt per person in America was $20,000. That was the average. And now it's like half of that because everybody's paying off everything that they owe. And it's because they see an economic collapse coming and all the people um, are using their brains, believe it or not, (laughs) and they're paying down all their debt as fast as they can go and nobody's spending any money. If we get Mitt Romney in there, that trend will tend to cease, and you'll have uh, a lot of people opening up their wallets, um, running lines of credit, spending on their credit cards. And you'll see, a, in this is personal opinion, that if a, Mitt Romney gets voted in, you're going to see a, an instant boom in the economy. It's going to be very short, short-lived, short-sighted, and it's going to be all based on malinvestment. Especially if uh, Romney starts pumping throwing the money, pumping money around, and creating pockets of malinvestment, people will definitely open up their wallets. And for at least three years, I think you're going to see an upswing and an uptrend in everything for a short amount of time. And that's I'm very hopeful for that because I'm not um, 100% ready to watch everything go helter skelter right this minute there's still some things i'd like to bite <laughs> well and, and, and it's very shallow i'm yeah. i'm 100 being 100 percent serious i'd like to see this country get three more good years i think she's going to drag down you know it's not gonna, oh three years we're done i think this this um sick mother is going to go out screaming you know and we're not going to go out quick but as far as being What's the word? I don't know. But the longer it goes, the harder it's going to fall. Totally broke. Totally destitute. Mm -hmm. 
that will be pushed out a little bit farther with Mitt Romney, and that's why I hope he wins. And just purely for selfish reasons. I don't have a four-wheeler yet. I'm trying to buy one. I think it'll... I'm, I'm just kidding, but that's... You know, I, on, the, on those same notes, though, Aaron, I would say I would personally, I would almost pref- I, I think I would. I would prefer to see Obama win and have it go down the tubes sooner rather than later. Because you know what? My kids are young right now, most of them. I mean, my oldest is 16. He'll be able to bounce back. I, we can get through the tough times as a family because little kids, and they'll look back at the at the tough times that we go through, you know, when we all had to eat. You remember that year that we had to eat rancid meat because it was all that we had left in the house? Boy, those are good times. Well, and and if, if I'm, I might as well just be totally honest, I don't care about four-wheelers. I don't plan on owning one. I don't feel like I have enough food stores and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I want more time. I hope Mitt Romney wins to give me more time to secure myself against everybody else. And that's what it comes down to. That's what... An end collapse looks like mm-hmm. securing yourself against everybody else while we wait for government to figure it out and come save us. I want it to last a little bit longer so I can get the heck out of here. Well, I wasn't going to say that. I'll just say it. Okay. I'm out of here. I want it to last three more years so I can make enough money to remove myself from this place. And I don't mean Alaska. Do you mean the continental United States of America? I love coming here and just... <laughs> Learning how incredibly screwed I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is it, it's better for you to learn now that you've got no future <laughs> and then, then, then for you to have some kind of a false hope as if somehow, Israel, you have got this great future in front of you. You don't. Your, what? Your parents, parents, parents set in motion something in this country that has taken away any illusion of freedom that you might ever have for your future. Congratulations. Steve, I think you need to vote more. <laughs> You're right. Oh. Reserve oh. something for me. There is always there's always hope. As long as there's a little bit of resistance out there, there's always hope. But I, I think that, though, goes back to my point of the longer we push it off, don't you think the harder it's going to be? I, mean, because I, it, I said it was... Purely selfish reasons. Uh, I, I understand 100% that. Selfish. But Aaron, it, even even that three years from now, assume that you, for all intents and purposes, that every single day you put away something. Is it going to be enough three years from now? Or at that point, are you going to say, you know, man, I wish I just had another three more years? Oh, sure, I understand that. And you too saw. Oh, I'm saying I'm I understand that, but it it's all time preference and. My time preference is to push it off a little bit farther. So you can be more prepared. So you can get out of here and do whatever you want to do. But right. It's funny though, because when you're thinking, I need to, I need more time so I can stock up on some food, or so I can buy more guns and ammo. I can do this and do that. The government. This goes back to what I was saying. The culture of fear. Now the government's sitting over there going. These people are stockpiling food. They got more guns and weapons, ammo. Oh, they're buying body armor. Let's see. We need to uh, arm the weather police or the weather channel people. The NOAA. NOAA people need to be armed. So they go buy a couple hundred thousand rounds of 40 caliber hollow points for them. So Joe Blow gets on the Internet. Oh, NOAA's armed now? Huh. I need to buy more food. I need to get more <laughs> guns. I need to get more ammo. Business then, is booming. Come down to far north. <laughs> and then, I mean, it's a continuous cycle because then the government goes, wow, these guys are buying more stuff. So yeah. now we need to arm the FDA. We need to arm whoever. I mean, F- actually, FDA every, is already yeah. armed. The federal, they just they just this week announced the purchase of hollow point um, ammunition for the Social Security Administration. Right. Every single every not. single federal agency in America is being armed right this minute. Why? Why is that? I have my own personal opinions why that is. Um, they're scared of the people. Yeah, I don't think it's 100% that they're scared of the people. Um, when you take an organization and you arm them, you're instantly giving them power. Now... If you're if you're sitting at the Social Security oh, office yeah, with a mundane job, and you're basically just a loser, you're a nobody, and all of a sudden the government issues you a gun, what does it give you? Power. It immediately gives you power. Now, when this thing shakes out, let's say this thing collapses, which way is that man that's been given petty power, which is the most vicious of all powers, 
That guy with his petty power and his gun, who's he going to lockstep with? Uh, I think oh, by oh, issuing... Oh, I know. I, he, he's going to go with the one who gave him the gun. <laughs> exactly. By by issuing guns to places like NOAA, the National Weather... Oceanic and atmospheric or something by or other. issuing firearms to them, what are they doing? They're solidifying their obedience. That's what they're doing. Yep. It's not oh Arming they're the slaves. It's not oh they're scared of the they're scared of the people. I don't believe that for a minute. Oh I do. Well, I, I mean of course that's a factor, but I mean if you, if they didn't have guns at all, then I'd say no, they're not scared of us at all. And then that would mean that we would they could still do what they wanted to do. If they weren't armed at all, they'd just say yeah these people are so stupid they'll march off and do whatever we tell them to do no matter what because we know they're going to leave their guns hidden in the. Right, but why, why would you give guys that know a guns? I mean, it's not like they're trained in all these... Oh, they're training them to make them, what you just said, solidify Obama's army, the federal army. He, I mean, it's going to be Romney's army here pretty soon, maybe. But it, we're not going to all of a sudden... I mean, think about that. If Romney's elected, all of a sudden these people are going to be unarmed? Heck no. No. Heck no. So you don't have to raise up this big federal army for everyone to look at and see. And it's like, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? You just arm all the people that already are, which is what they just did. Every single entity that works for the federal government just got armed, didn't they? Mm-hmm. All the way down to the weather service. Homeland Security bought 1.4 billion rounds of ammunition. Bill- billion. And I don't think it's because they're afraid of some... Dudes in Pakistan riding their camel across the ocean, invading us. Guarantee that's not the reason they're doing it. <laughs> I don't think they're worried about Nicaragua. I don't think they've watched Red Dawn so many times that they think that Cuba's going to invade us at any time soon. The only reason for them to arm themselves that way is to put down civil unrest in the United States of America, I, which is coming to a theater in town <laughs> near you. I, I get emails all the time from people who talk about uh, the, the, the FEMA camps and talk about the idea that somehow the military, the U.S. military is being trained for domestic deployment. I, I, I wouldn't have believed it, except I actually saw a video in which they were, it, it was a real army video where they were talking in, in terms of recruiting people to come and learn how to be an internment camp guard. And I'm, I'm looking at this. It's not a spoof. It's not a uh, – it, it wasn't produced by somebody who was just trying to be doing the fear-mongering thing to go out and have more people come and buy ammunition. I mean, this is this was a real government-produced recruitment video of, of basically telling somebody how, hey, you too can come and learn how to be an internment camp guard. Of course, you're going to have to treat our fellow citizens with the utmost respect so that we can get them back to their homes when the crisis is over. It made my jaw drop. I, you can go on FedBizOps right now and find solicitations from uh, FEMA. They're actually setting up, I think it's called Blue Force. Is that what it is? Where it's actual... A communication device, basically, that will tell you who the friendlies and enemies are in theater. FEMA, I don't think, gets deployed to any theater outside of the United States. I might be wrong, but... So they're looking for this Blue Force thing that'll tell them... Basically, you can sit in your command post and see who who your guys are, and any guys that aren't the little Blue Force guys are enemy. So, get out there... Register to vote early and vote, vote, vote. <laughs> That's the solution I, to I, our problem. I know that you're being tongue-in-cheek, but yeah. in case anybody just tuned in, you are not advocating that. Just like, I mean, but I've heard like Glenn Beck all of a sudden in the last like two months, all of it, he's become this parrot of we need to mobilize the vote. Mm-hmm. We need to get people registered to vote. You need to go and get all your friends and neighbors and help, and help them to register to vote and then get them to the polls in November. As if somehow that is going to do anything at all to help us when this collapse that we're talking about hits us. How How is that possibly going to help? Except, I mean, Aaron has mentioned this a number of times, The what happened with Carthage. Yep. When they were being invaded by Rome, they were still 
in the midst of a political election season. They were campaigning in the streets as the Romans were outside the gates. How did that voting help them? It didn't do a doggone thing. It just made it that much easier for their enemies to run to overrun them, didn't it? It made it quite easy. <laughs> yeah, and they did. I want to read this thing I read in the first hour with Lou Rockville. On the other hand, I, I won't read the whole thing. We do have the freedom to not vote. No one has yet drafted us into a voting booth. I suggest that we exercise our right to not participate. It's one of the few rights we have left. Non-participation sends a message we no longer believe in the racket they cooked up for us, and we want no part of it. You might say that this is ineffective, but what effect does voting have? That's like the bingo phrase right there. It gives them what they need the most. It gives them the mandate. Non-participation helps deny that to them. It makes them on the, just on the margin, just a little bit, a bit more fearful that they are ruling us without our consent. That is all to the good. The government should fear the people. Not voting is a good beginning toward instilling that fear. This year especially, there are no lesser of two evils. There is socialism or fascism. The true American spirit should guide every voter to have part of either. Have no part of either. Go vote. And you give them the mandate to do exactly what all this fear mongering stuff we were just talking about. But it's really happening. You're yeah. giving the mandate. That's okay. Uh, I believe it's okay for you guys to buy a billion and a half rounds that let's see. That would have had to come out of my my, my pocket. A friend of mine just texted me, he said that who bought those billion rounds? He did. Yeah, the to American, be used against them. The American people. All right, stay with us. You've got it on Patriots Lament right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's Local Talk Radio, but we are also streaming live on the Internet at KFAR660.com. In the studio with us, as always, from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And from Far North Tactical, we've got Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. And we've also got Israel Bennett over there on the side corner. Good morning, Israel. Good morning. All right. An up-and-coming radical. Oh no, we, we've already we're trying to beat that out of him right now. We're reminding him that he has no hope. Oh. That he has no future. That if things continue as they are right now with our current political system, basically, that you're screwed. Maybe he's a constitutional scholar. The hope of liberty in the past has always been in the hands of the radicals. So. There are still a few out there. Unfortunately, we've messed up what the term means and turned it into something that shouldn't be, but whatever. I just listened to Ryan on there, Mr. Paul Ryan. The president promised unemployment wouldn't be 8%, and he lied because it is. And and I'm not going to tell about the part where when Bush left office, it was 7.8% unemployment. Obama was only in there for a month, and it was 8.3%. So that's kind of a dead dog there, Paul Ryan. I mean, if anyone with half a brain quit listening to your baloney coming out of your mouth and look it up for themselves, these guys are a bunch of lion sacks. All of them are a bunch of lion sacks of kitty manure. <laughs> uh, all, all of them just want a bunch of power, and they're all liars. Both parties are liars. Both parties offer the same thing. Just get off your knees and quit begging them to give more of it to you. That's all we're asking for. Be filled with some liberty for once. Quit being a slave and a serf. Be a radical. But how do you how do you take someone who has been a slave his entire life and expect him to live like a free man? It's pretty dang hard. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you know that all you have to do is get up and push the button in the morning and you've got breakfast served. How do you teach a man to make himself breakfast? Some people, I think, breakfast is just going to have to be taken from them before they realize, oops. When their breakfast doesn't show up, that's for some, that's going to be the hard part. For some, that's going to be the wake-up call. Yeah, and when they get the their chaos. breakfast taken away from them, people are going to scream for them. When they get their breakfast taken away from them, people are going to scream for that breakfast to come back. When people are going to ask, beg, and advocate for even bigger government than they just lost. Definitely. The answer in everyone's mind is going to be more government, more oppression, more oppressive government, definitely. Yeah, we won't be any different than Greece. 
And look at those idiots over there. They're so bankrupt, it's not even funny. They have to borrow, I mean, they basically, they can't borrow money, but they give them money anyways, just so they don't completely fall into utter chaos and burn to the ground. And yet, when the austerity measures come up, the people go, heck no, we want more. We want more. You can't you, take away our retirement. They <laughs> promised us our retirement. Right, and other other countries are propping them up because they don't want, because this illusion. Domino effect. Right, they, this illusion of uh, of fiat money. If one of them falls, they could all fall. Yes, so, and does anyone know about the riots that happened this week in, in Italy? Yes. Does anybody know about the riots that happened this week in Spain? Well, they didn't talk about them Did much, anybody but... know about the riots that happened this week in France? The domino effect is already happening because no matter how much they want to pretend that they can prop up Greece, the people recognize that they can't. And the people across Europe see themselves falling off the cliff just like Greece is. And it, it's like if you go mountain climbing and all these people are roped together, at some point, no matter how much you love that guy, you may have to consider cutting the rope. Yeah, they're or else you're all going off the cliff. They're done. I just think I just think it's funny that they are done. They have no money of their own. And yet they still say, Absolutely not. I want my check. I don't know how Greeks talk, but Mamma Mia, something like that. But they want their check, no matter what. <laughs> Give them their check. You better not take that away. We'll burn this country to the ground. Well, you fools, you're broke. You've already destroyed your country. Well, look at even the people here in our own backyard, here in Alaska, who talk about, oh, the coming collapse. First thing we have to do is we have to get together and make our, our new government. And yeah, we've what, heard that right here. No, you've heard that from Schaefer Cox. I mean, this guy that everybody is saying, oh, he's a martyr because he's in jail for something he didn't do or what he threatened to do. The guy was talking about becoming a dictator. He was talking about the military overthrow of the government and then making himself the king. You don't overthrow one timer and just replace it with another, do you? No, well, and, I, and I don't agree with what happened to him, but that's absolutely what his mentality was. I was, I knew him pretty well. Mm-hmm. Well, we've and talked about if we had a point. collapse here, people call in and say, well, the first thing we'd have to do is find that good guy to start the government over and rule over us. And give us a king. And expropriate from us to no, no. give us that protection. So, Let's take the phone call. <laughs> Five eight talk is the number. Good morning. Anymore. <laughs> this is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Are you still there? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Frank Turney. Hey, Frank, Frank. How's it going, man? Pretty good. I see the two key words is fascism and socialism. <laughs> My two favorite governments. Uh, I'd like to share something, being from the old school of thought. Uh, in the early years of the public school, or in public addresses by politicians. America is touted touted as the land of the free and the land of opportunity or the greatest country on earth. We are taught from near infancy that this country is founded on the right to say what you want, whatever, wherever, to whomever. We are told we have the freedom to assembly peacefully, to petition our leaders for redress of grievances. We are taught that we are apprehended by the law. You have a right to a fair trial and legal representation. You know, I went out to the fair out there. I keep bringing this up. I had 19 politicians running for office. Only one mentioned the U.S. Constitution. That was Senator Cogill. And I went over all these brochures, and he was the only one that mentioned the Constitution. Uh, it's amazing how many sheep we got out there who were being duped by our elected officials. I have to say it again. that. The, the, that swore into an oath to uphold the Constitution, last of the Constitution. That's where we're being duped, and uh, we don't hold these people accountable at all. Yeah. And uh, I just like to say, uh, you guys are the freedom keepers of liberty. <laughs> Love your show. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Frank. You. All right. How There's do I my keep, radical right there. How do you keep freedom, Frank? If, if by, by the very fact of keeping it, aren't you not vigilant, free? <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, four five eight talk is Total the number. Eternal vigilance. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Lee. Lee, go ahead. Hey, you're commenting about the when people when their breakfast wasn't served that they were going to riot. Well, I think in our country that may translate to you turn on the tube and if there either is nothing there or your favorite sports show isn't there, your basketball game, your football game, soccer, tennis, whatever, uh, <laughs> isn't there, and the people they're going to say, what the happened? How, what happened? What's the matter here? And that'll 
be the wake-up call is when their sporting event doesn't appear before their face in front of their screen. <laughs> and uh, it's just sad, the, the amount of time and energy and money that we dedicate to sports and other TV-associated uh, activities and pay no attention to the, the, the ongoing uh, onslaught of our liberties and uh, freedoms. Do you That's know? All I have to say. The, the, isn't that happened be, uh, before, Aaron? What do you? I was going to say the the national average of people that the national average of hours watched by the average American in um, in America is five hours per day My of God. TV. That's scary. This has happened before, though. Think about ancient Rome. As long as you have your bread, your free your free bread from the government. As long as you've got your circuses to keep you entertained, what's the yep. problem? Yep. What's yep. the problem? But where, how did – you have to look at how ultimately they, they succumbed to that. They didn't succumb to that from the the bread and circuses themselves. It was – they loosened up their system to a participatory form of government, the same way that Carthage fell. Carthage fell with Rome at their gate, tearing it down, and they were still having internal squalor over who was going to hold the reins of power. They – in my study of Carthage, the Romans the Romans had actually taken over half of their city. They owned half of it, and they were still politically infighting over an election because they were having an election cycle at that time. They had all of the um, what, what I can't remember what they're called, but all the harbor guys, all the guys you know they were a port city, so it, all the harbor people they had tremendous pull, and they were having uh riots with each other, billy club type, beat each other down at the polling places while Rome was had half their city taken over. We do we do the same stinking I thing. I think we would do the same stinking we thing. We are. Too. We're going down. All we're worried about is going beating ourselves down there to see who we're going to vote for. You know, when we ask the, why is it so hard to get people to want to be free, I just want to read back with the... Uh, De La Boete again from 1552 makes me feel a little bit better that this question's been going on for over 500 years. You mean we didn't come up with it? And he says, I I don't know how it happens that nature fails to place in the hearts of men a burning desire for liberty, a blessing so great, so desirable that when it's lost, all evils follow thereafter, and even the blessing that remains lose taste and savor because of the corruption by servitude. Liberty is the only joy which men do not seem to assist, insist on. For surely, if they really wanted it, they could receive it. Apparently, they refuse this wonderful privilege because it is so easily required, acquired. Lee, thanks for the call. You bet. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is the number. This is Patriot's Lament. Who's this? This is Alan. Alan, go ahead. Hey, I was just saying, you know, you're on the TV thing and talking about it, and I'm guilty of it. I watch TV a lot and whatnot, and I was going to ask you, have you, uh, any of you, watched a TV show on TNT called Falling Skies, a sci-fi sort of a geeky show? I uh, I can't speak for everybody here, but I don't have TV. Oh, okay. I can't even, I don't even have my TV hooked up where I can get local channels, let alone any kind of cable. I always justify in my mind if I have time to watch TV, I have time to read, and so that's what <laughs> Reading, I think. Understandable. Reading's understandable. too hard. <laughs> and, and and I, I mean, I don't want to totally go out and make my set myself up to be better than everybody else. I I love playing games. I spend too much time playing video games. That's for sure. Killing on them zombies. Yeah, and I and I play online. I do. I'm playing an interactive role with other people all over the world playing video games. <clears throat> So I'm not right. I'm not 100 percent. Oh, I'm holier than thou. I read books. <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> but well, here's the funny thing: is, is is this TV show is basically an invasion of alien life forms on America and how or on the world and how government is broke, how how the system breaks down and whatnot. But no matter what, it always ends up with a dictator leader. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's just sort of funny how the mainstream basically. You know, that's their theory is no matter what, there's going to be a dictator leadership. One person rules the whole thing. Hmm. 
you know what? We'll, we'll get clamor it, for it, probably. Get it out of the, the science fiction. Get it out of the, the fiction in general. You hear that in the political realm all the time. I don't know how many of my friends I have heard say, we just need to elect the right person. Right. You the know, right dictator. You know, whether you're electing a dictator for life over the entire country or whether you're electing somebody to the borough assembly, if your mindset is, I just need to elect the right person to tell us what to do, then you're buying into that mentality, aren't you? I, yeah. That, 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 go, go, go ahead. I was just going to say something totally off the topic. Since right, we're, talking, thanks, about, Al, since we're talking about TV, I am super stoked. Red Dawn is going to be out yeah, on Red Thanksgiving Dawn Day. Too. I was going to make a comment about TV, too. That's funny. <laughs> I, I was going to say that uh, if, if people want to be... Uh, pressured into watching less tv just play video games instead of tvs if i if i was to watch tv like if i put in a movie or something like that um the fiance she has no problem watching if i play video games i get griped at and i'm back to reading a book in like 10 minutes yeah so for all the guys that uh find themselves watching too much tv switch to video games and you'll get kicked off (laughs) or at least watch some good movies like the patriot that's bad of the bone shooter that's a pretty good decent movie yeah, there are some good movies I recommend for sure. But Red Dawn, I'm so thrilled. Oh, that was like my favorite movie of all time, the first one. My best friend Butch and I watched it repeatedly as young children, dementing our minds and constantly in fear of a Russian invasion from that movie. I can see that in awful lot of the Wolverines in you there, my friend. And I also remember and we spent hours and hours with our toy machine guns killing Russians and Cubans and standing for freedom and standing on... The cow piles, you know, are piled up in the pasture. And Wolverine! Yeah, I can't wait. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? It's Winston. Winston, go ahead. Yeah, uh, 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 I, I, I firmly support Hillbilly. Uh, 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 just uh, uh, let him, uh, 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 anybody goes to step on him, they got to step on me too. All right. That's right. that's you know what we need more of that we need more right. people. Well, uh, that, that's 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 all it all it yeah. Oh, oh, what they're doing in Washington that don't matter the hell of beans. Um, oh, um, um, let's just stand up for hillbilly. All right, but I, I I'd like to make a little point on that. A little bit of issue I have with what he said when he called in. It isn't that he was necessarily standing up for anything. He drove without a driver's license and he self admittedly went in there to their court system and they let him go. It wasn't there's no um standing up, there's no rebelling against he's he's asking for their permission still. He's going into their court system and he self admittedly well, I don't know why, but they let me go this time, they let me go last time. Doesn't mean they're always going to, but they did and God's taking care of me, which I commend that. And I'm not discrediting it, but I'm saying that's not that's not a stand for liberty. I don't believe it is at all. I think it's him saying, well, they let me go. You know, I saw the police officer and he waved at me. Right now we're just buddies. You know, and they're just kind of viewing him as ridiculous, it would seem. I, I don't think they see him as a threat. Oh, there oh. you go. And so they're not putting him in a cage just yet. But if he keeps on calling into the radio station and encouraging people not to get a driver's license, encouraging people not to use the Federal Reserve note, encouraging people not to participate in the system... Using himself as the example of why they could get away with it... Then eventually he is going to be a threat and they will put him in a cage. And Winston, they'll put you in a cage too. Right along... Uh, uh, if, 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 they can, uh, uh, if they can get their hands on it. Well, uh, every, was, everybody... To, come on, everybody to says that, that Winston... Day. Everybody says when they get, if they can get their hands on me, and when they come to get me, this and that. But the stark truth of it is, they do. Mm-hmm. They oppress you every single day in every way that you think can think of, and you accept it. And there's not going to be some catalyst point where you decide that you're not going to take it anymore because you've been taking it your whole life. I do like Uh-oh. what you said about uh, who cares what goes on in Washington. We do spend way too much of our time. And our energy, worrying about what people, what our rulers, three thousand three thousand miles away, miles away are doing. Right. Don't be worried about this little town. I was talking to town. a fellow the other day, and uh, uh, he said he had, uh, and he was from outside, uh, uh, down in the lower 48. 
and he said he had a a, 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 a neighbor down there, said he is 85 years old, and he got, got stopped by a, a law enforcement officer. Law enforcement officer says, hey, uh, uh, I want to see your driver's license. The fellow looked at him, he said, I've been driving since I was 15 years old, and he said, I've never had a driver's license. And the cop looked at him, and he said, well, you know how to drive. And uh, 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 turned around, and got back in his in, in his police car, and and, and drove off. Uh, as long as it's 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 individuals that we're dealing with, uh, 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 we can deal with individuals. Uh, uh, it's, it, 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 it's it's the government that we can't that we have to hang the bastards. I mean, it's just. Uh, 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 but individuals we can deal with. Yeah, but isn't government us? Isn't government no, the people? No, no, government no, is no, the no. individual. Uh, that's of course it is, or we wouldn't lend so much Governance. legitimacy to it. We lend the legitimacy to this government by the fact that we can all participate in it and we can all be it. Winston, what gives them the authority to pull you over for not wearing a seatbelt? None. No, we did. When when we sent I these don't. people down to Juno and gave them the authority to make laws out of thin air, when they decided that it can now be a primary offense for a police officer to pull you over and give you a citation because you are not wearing a seatbelt. Well, I, think, I think he's saying that he hasn't because he, from what I know from Winston here, I don't think that he's a participant. That's what he's saying. He hasn't given Nobody them the permission. Right, but we can't sit there and advocate for our constitutionally limited government in the way that it's set up and then turn around and complain about oppressive laws. We can't turn around and complain about everybody participate, participating in the participatory government that was set up. <laughs> I mean, there's a free... Only the there, slaves participate. Roger that. Uh, all right, there we go. Thanks, yeah, Winston. Okay. Appreciate that. That was a good jam. 458-TALK is the number. That's the title of the show. That's it. All right, good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriot's Lament. All right, looks like we cleared the lines with that one. Only the slaves participate. I like that. All right, we've got seven minutes left in which to convince somebody out there somewhere to stop participating in the uh, the slavery in your, your mutual accepted slavery. 458 talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Israel had something. Good morning, guys. It's Robert. got to yell. Hang on I'm, a second. I'm uh, hey. calling in because I got a little bit of a story about working within the system I think you'd like. I used to work with a lady who has a brother who's a farmer in Washington State, and they uh, love their little regulations down there. <laughs> but uh, he had some neighbors that moved to the rural part of the state from the city, and they did it because they wanted to commune with nature and be closer to the wildlife. Well, he had a beaver on his property that was building dams on the local stream and flooding out his fields. So what he he wanted to do was trap the beaver and have him relocated. And... Uh, <laughs> next generation here but uh, the liberals who moved in next door told him that he couldn't trap it and relocate it live trap it so what they did is they filed a request with the Department of Wildlife there to prohibit him from running his tractor in the daytime because that's when the beavers were sleeping and it was disturbing them. so as a result he put some lights on the tractor and he started farming at night, and the neighbors were sleeping. <laughs> now, it, it's one of those of people trying to put their ideals on other people by force that keeps creating the problems we're always complaining about. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate that. And we're going to go to uh, Israel here. Go ahead. I read an interesting book called Whatever Happened to Justice by Richard Mayberry. And uh, in one of the chapters, he was talking about Republicans and Democrats. And he said, it doesn't matter whether, whether you are a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't, they, ha they have their own points of views because of the stupid name that they're given. But it doesn't say 
how the individual thinks. Like Obama or Mitt Romney, it doesn't say how they're going to think just because one wants war, one doesn't. Uh, yeah, right. They're still a Republicrat. <laughs> and they're the same thing. It, it doesn't matter uh, what your name is. It doesn't say how you're going to think and what kind of decisions you're going to make. Right, because uh, his point was like, who is uh, the Democrats? They're the anti-war people, right? And who is always getting us into wars? Democrats. And the Republicans, they're supposed to be the cons- fiscal and, conservatives. And anti, Anti-big government, right? Right, and what do they give us? Wait, more government and more spending and more deficit. Do we have a Democrat that got us into World War One? Uh, it was Wilson, Democrat. World War Two? Yeah. Ro- Roosevelt, Democrat. Uh, Korea War? Korea. Truman, government, Democrat. Vietnam? Johnson, wait, well, first I Kennedy. guess Kennedy, but then Johnson, Democrat, both of them. Republicans ramped it up with the Middle East, though. So. And yeah. so the Democrats. Ah, good point. What Israel just said, whatever happened to justice, just because these guys got R's or D's in front of their name, whatever they think, once they get elected into power, that power takes over their mind, and they're going to use it. Well, they're going to use their power to go to war. They're going to use their power to tax. They're going to use their power and their boot to oppress you yeah, and wa- to kill you. I wanted to hit on that just a little bit more. So let's go to the Republican side, and they're the fiscal conservatives, lower taxes, stuff like that. Reagan. He created the education department. He also raised taxes higher than anybody. Nixon gave us the EPA. (laughs) George Bush uh, gave us the, uh, well, the first George Bush. I mean, you look at basically... Didn't Reagan create the biggest deficit ever? I mean, up to up to that point. Up to that point. Yeah, that's been left in the dust. Didn't George Bush until Obama came along? Didn't George Bush beat him out on that? Oh yeah, four trillion dollars of debt. You're talking about Bush the second, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've had so many government entities created by by whim, by fiat, by command of the commander in chief too, which is again not constitutional. Were you going to say something? I was going to say, well, let's just say they all gave us everything. Oh. Period. That's an interesting idea. We owe our very existence to the government. Well, sure we do. They own us. How dare we question them? I think, I think we covered that in the first hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, action point for today. we got a minute. Read. Do not participate. Pull out your participation. It gets rid of their legitimacy. It makes them a little bit scared that maybe they're ruling over you without your consent. Stand up. Get off your knees. And please... Don't go and vote. Think about it for once. Think about what you're doing when you're pulling that lever, marking that chad, doing whatever. Really ask yourself, what am I really doing? What am I really giving my consent to? Think about it for once. And go to the patriotslament.blogspot.com and rant a little bit. Rant. And uh, also the... Yeah, I wish people would get on there and challenge us something. The YouTube channel. YouTube is Radio Free Fairbanks. Right. See lots of good stuff on there. Dave Giesel even uh, on the blog. If you guys, I miss him. But anyways, you can get on the blog, and he's got quite a few good articles on there that he's posted up too. Somebody needs to go out and get that sheep and put him back in the corral. No. All right, guys. We'll see you again next Saturday morning at 9 a.m. right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. Have a great day.